So uh, a theme scripture for us this morning on this World Communion Sunday. Ephesians 2, 13 through 18. Now you have, now, now, in light of what Christ has done, now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people in his own body on the cross. He broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross. And our hostility toward each other has been put to death. He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles while you were far away from him. And peace to the Jews who were near. Now all of us, now all of us, that means all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. Uh, World Communion Sunday is a tradition observed in in many, most uh, United Methodist churches around the world. We're a global denomination, Uh, but it's not just us. Lots and lots of denominations uh, celebrate World Communion Sunday. Uh, It is sort of a celebration of that part of the Apostles' Creed where it talks about the church being uh, one holy Catholic and apostolic. It's it's worldwide. God didn't just just choose one one people group that he came for all people group. The Jesus Jesus isn't just a savior for the Jews, that he's a savior uh, for all people, um, and that the church is open to all nations and races and languages. And so today, uh, as we come and celebrate communion, uh, communion symbolizes that, that one loaf of bread broken up and eaten by many diverse people. Well, now we know it's, for, it's, it's one, one loaf, the, the body of Christ eaten all around the world today uh, to celebrate Jesus being savior of all. Um, And we know that that's going to happen in diverse places like cathedrals and um, and in warehouses and in auditoriums and in basilicas and little country chapels and in places, uh, some places of the world in hiding, in secret. Uh, So because it's it's, uh, something you might be persecuted for in many places. We we know that around the table today, uh, around the world, that, that Christ is being worshiped. Uh, in different languages, in different traditions, in different styles, in different ways. And yet, at the end of the day, it's one Lord, one church, one faith, one baptism, uh, one Lord of all. So our service today is, uh, is our attempt to reflect that, that worldwide diversity, but really it's an expression of our diversity. Um, because within our church, we, we represent the entire world. Uh, if you look around, you see these flags. Uh, we didn't just randomly pick them, see which ones we could find on sale. Uh, these specifically are us. Um, there are 37 uh, countries, kingdoms, nationalities, territories represented in these flags, and they're you. They're, they're me. Look around the room uh, at all of our services. This This is us. Isn't that amazing? 37 different nationalities. And yes, we know they represent, you know, a certain geographical location, a certain ruler, a certain political regime, a certain way of governing. But really for us today, they represent people and diversity of of life experience and history and language and culture. Uh, This is our congregation, the diversity of all. Now I said 37, there's actually 38 flags. I just wanna make a quick comment about that. The most important flag up here above all others is right? That no matter how patriotic you may be, which is fine, that the highest flag of all when we become a Christian is the flag of the kingdom of God. That we, that we enter into another kind of spiritual nationality and our loyalty becomes to a different ruler. Jesus Christ who is Lord of Lord, King of Kings uh, of all the universe, right? Okay, enough, enough so you get that, you get that. Uh, it reminds me of what it says in Revelation 7, 9 through 10. After this I looked and there before me was a great multitude. No one could count. From every nation, tribe, 
people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Now, I could be wrong, but I don't read in that that there's going to be different sections in heaven. Like, would you please join the Latin section over here? And, and uh, we're going to have our Europeans over here and, uh, and our, our, our Southeast Asians, if you would kind of go over there. And we'll keep our Americans over here. And uh, I, it sounds to me like a melting pot, a blend, right, of, of, of all kinds of people all gathering together, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Listen to this. They're wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hand. And they cried out in a loud voice. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Interesting. All singing the same song, but it says people of every nation, tribe, and language, right? That in heaven, apparently, for all of eternity, we will finally be united. We'll finally overcome all of the differences that separate us. And yet... The overcoming of the differences isn't the overcoming of diversity. That even in the Bible it says that in heaven we will remain to be a diverse people. That God is best worshipped in many, many voices. Every nation, every tribe, every people, every language. Um, So it's interesting to me that there is something this side of heaven in our human nature that tends to resist that. Now, we're a, we're a church of 37 nations. That's a remarkable thing, but that's unusual, friends. Most churches I know of that I've personally experienced are monocultural. They, they, everybody kind of is of the same uh, shade of skin. Everybody speaks the same language. Everybody basically is from the same neighborhoods. Most churches I know, uh, like kind of gravitates to like. Some have said that Sunday morning worship is the most segregated hour of the week in the United States. And there is something in our human nature that that does that, right? That we tend to gravitate to those people that we are familiar with, that we understand, that we can relate to easily. Well, my question this morning is, if the goal ultimately in heaven is that we learn to value and celebrate our diversity, that we sing to God in a harmony of diverse voices, what are we waiting for? As you've heard me say before, whatever we will be in heaven, God intends for us to start being now. And so one of the great gifts, I think, of this church, one of the great strengths of this church is our diversity. But let me just challenge us. Even as diverse as we are and as great as that is, we're not nearly as diverse as our world or our community, our neighborhood, There's an opportunity here, friends, for us to grow in our diversity. And I would even argue that most Sundays, unlike today, we still act and sound like a white church. And there's nothing wrong with white churches. But Scripture seems to indicate that there's a greater richness in God's diversity. Right? It's like planting a forest with just one kind of tree or a a garden with just one kind of flower. It's just not quite as beautiful. So I'm talking about today, about what it means to be a multi-ethnic church, which we are, a church of 37. Every continent, by the way, is represented by one of these flags, except Antarctica, and we're looking for somebody. (laughs) But also what it means to be multicultural, to embrace, as we've heard this morning, a diversity of voice and style and perspective and and way. Now, uh, let me just throw this in here. Uh, we have not just like left our transformed series. Um, if you're paying attention to the series, today, this week, we come to our relational health. And there is something for many of us that we tend to have relationships with people who are similar to us, right? We tend to gravitate to those people. Our families often look like us, our social group often looks like us, not always, but to a large degree. And so I'm wondering this week if there might be an opportunity as we talk about our families and our friends to just this morning take advantage of it being World Communion Sundays and wonder aloud, what would it be like to be more intentional about developing friendships, relationships, spiritual connections with people who are culturally, ethnically different than you? Right? To stretch beyond your comfort zone and to embrace, to see if maybe there's a gift there in those people who are different than you. So easy to stay within what's comfortable and what's familiar 
and with what we know. And so today we're going to be talking about how we develop relationships spiritually and cross-culturally. We read just a moment ago, Ephesians 2.14, For Christ himself has brought us peace. He united Jews and Gentiles into the people when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. Basically, Gentile means non-Jew. And so for Jews, there were two categories of people, us and them. Us and Gentiles, Gentiles we know, represented a whole lot of different kind of people, including most of us in the room. Most of us would be Gentiles, if not for Christ. But there was hostility. Jews like, we're in, you're out, right? There, there was a, a separation, Well, I think we could also say that there is a separation that still exists, but Christ has has intended to bring peace to us. Whatever ethnic, cultural divisions we might experience, that Christ has come to tear down the walls that separate us. Uh, Rob Bell once said, What a beautiful thing it is to join with a church that has gathered and find yourself looking around thinking, What could this group of people possibly have in common? What a beautiful thing that is. So the question, friends, this morning is, will we embrace our diversity? Will we embrace the diversity of our community? Will we celebrate it? Will we treat it with deep respect and honor and appreciation? Will we welcome it? Will we embody it? Are we willing to work for it? so that we can fully embrace the gift that God has given us. This morning, I'll be sharing a little, and Pastor Cheryl and Pastor Josias also will be sharing a little bit of story of how we have found the gift of building spiritual relationships outside of our our kind of our home, natural, uh, uh, ethnic backgrounds. And so, invite Pastor Josias. Welcome him, will you? (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Del libro de Efesios, capítulo 2, versículo 14, lee de la siguiente manera. Porque Él es nuestra paz, quien de ambos nos hizo uno, Él derribó en su carne la barrera de división, es decir, la hostilidad. That's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, that Pastor Vance just read. Uh, good morning. My name is Josías. Josias, if you prefer, that's the, my, it's not my Mayan name, but it's my Spanish name, Josias. So you can call me uh, Josias if you prefer. Uh, I'm originally from Honduras. I'm one of the pastors here. And um, my parents uh, came from the rural part of Honduras to the city. Uh, I believe I have a picture over there of my parents. That picture is quite new, right? It's... <laughs> It's been a while, but uh, so they came from the rural to the city to go to Bible school, and they started uh, over there, and they became pastors, so I was born in church. I was in church before I was even born, and so um, as one of those relationships that was built being in church at that early stage, um, one of the contacts we, we had was with a lot of missionaries. And that's my first cross-cultural contact that I had with uh, Miss Frances Bear, the first missionary that I met that came to Honduras. These were um, a generation of people that left their comfort of their home. They left their family, friends back here in the United States and went to Honduras to share the love of Christ. Uh, so we're thankful for them. Actually, Miss Frances taught me how to ride a bike when she was 70-something years old. So we still have plenty to give, right? Um, and so as, as I said, I was, uh, as I was growing up in church, uh, there were a lot of uh, um, mission trips that were going to Honduras. And well, as a social teenager that I was, I was tr- always trying to get involved. Did I mention uh, pretty American girls? I mean, uh, I was trying to learn English. And so, uh, although I, I, I didn't know how, and they didn't know how to speak Spanish, but we didn't care that we say the words in the wrong way we wanted to communicate. And, they, and, and we wanted to be intentional about knowing each other. And one of, in one of those um, trips, I noticed that one um, guy over there had with him kind of a book kind of like this. 
And he was always full with pictures and things, and he was always posting things, and I mean, like sticking things literally, not posting like in, on the internet. But actually, it was the pre-post uh, digital era. So he was uh, just writing things and always and always going to the side uh, and praying, and 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 it kind of uh, called my attention because then I knew, I learned that there was something more than just the thrill and the fun of visiting a different country. It was a deeper meaning. And when I think about that deeper meaning, I definitely go to uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 11. Uh, it's going to be on the screen. I'll read it from here. And it says, Anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord for all, and richly bless all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good, the good news. That's my concept of all those missionaries that invested in our lives. And the incredible part of that is that, like I said, I, never, I learned English like a, like a child, talking to people, watching movies. That's how I learned English. I never wanted to come to the United States until I married and my wife wanted to come over here. But it was a deeper plan because that God wanted to bring me here. And now I get to do what they did in my country, I get to do here in this country now. And I don't mean that in an offensive way, but there's a lot of people that are coming to do that now here. And so I just want to think about the intentionality behind our actions. Now we don't need to leave the country. We just need to go to the grocery store and we have a cross-cultural interaction if we want to, if we are willing, right? But we need to be intentional about that. So thank you for uh, allowing me to uh, speak a little bit of my uh, experience now. Uh, I will ask the um, ushers to come forward to collect the offering. And while we do that, uh, we'll hear also a little bit of um, uh, Pastor Sherry's experience. From Ephesians 2, verse 14. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. Hi, I am Cheryl Marks Williams. I've been a pastor for 14 years, though just serving at First Church for the past nine months. As an immigrant from Jamaica to the United States, all my relationships outside of family are cross-cultural. I, along with 244 million other people around the world, forge hybrid identities as we neither belong to the place from which we came nor to the place where we have arrived. We simply do not fit snugly in the mold of either place. It is much easier to form friendships with people who are also living in a hybrid space. But what does it really mean to form a friendship with people who see you as less than they are? It is now the process of trying to help them to understand that I am a regular human being and then finding the commonalities between the two of us. But God said to me, you, my friend, were brought to this place to help people understand what it means to love those who are different. But I must say I have had some of the best best relationships with people from other cultures. 
I've had the privilege of traveling to many countries around the world and being exposed to people who are very different, who worship differently and who enjoy life differently. And I have been enriched by these experiences. Although cross-cultural relationships are challenging, they are worth the effort. Diversity is not an accident. That God made us different from different cultures and people have been on the move since the time of Abraham it is worth the effort. The richness of traditions blending together, the richness of worship um, strengthening each other, the difference is in, in ways of prayer are gratifying to the human spirit. Although they are challenging, I hold it is worth the effort. We'll be much better off for having friends from other cultures. Uh, you may not realize, uh, Cheryl's not here uh, today, uh, she's on a brief leave finishing her doctoral dissertation, which is not a small uh, task, so she had to go to Kentucky for a few weeks, so she'll be back with us end of October, but she said there's blessing and diverse friendship, relationship. I would ask there's, uh, I add to that there's blessing for me uh, in, in having colleagues, uh, Hoseas and Cheryl, to work alongside. There's blessing to you to have diversity in your pastors. Um, and so I hope that you'll remember Cheryl this week in your prayer in the weeks to come. Uh, so if you drop me uh, just anywhere randomly around the world, um, I'm guessing that most people would guess that, that there's, a, there's, a, there's a North American. Um, it's, it's no real confusing me for uh, any other group. But as a North American, I belong to a unique subculture of the North American culture that is Southern. Right? I, I have grown up in the Deep South. Um, uh, I was born and raised in Orlando, which doesn't feel Southern today, but it did when I was a child. Uh, my mom's family was all Southern. My, great, my grandfather was from Brunswick, North uh, Georgia. Uh, my mom's family all from around uh, Beaufort, uh, South Carolina. I went to seminary in North Carolina and Kentucky. I spent my summers in Nashville. Uh, most of my ministry has been in North Florida, in Tallahassee, and Jacksonville, which does not look much like the rest of Florida, really. It's just South Georgia, Southern Alabama when you get up there. Uh, we were minutes away from peaches and pecan, pecans and, uh, and cotton up there. So uh, I have been immersed in Southern culture, uh, you will hear me frequently say y'all, or if I'm talking to all y'all, I'll say all y'all, right? Uh, I, I, I'm Southern, most of you are not. You know, like there, there's differences just even within our own uh, North American culture of ways we say things, food we eat, uh, the way we view the world, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I went to kindergarten and all of public school in Orlando, and the year I started kindergarten, the US, US Supreme Court uh, forced, ordered uh, the Orange County Public Schools to begin integration of public schools through busing. They've been integrated private previously, but if you didn't live in the neighborhood, you didn't, you didn't go there. Um, so I grew up in uh, diverse classes, uh, but I was aware, I think, at a very early age that um, mom would walk to pick me up from school. We'd walk home. I lived in the neighborhood. And for some reason, all of the African-American students had to get on buses and go somewhere else. And I didn't know where because I had never seen the neighborhoods they came from because in those days you didn't cross the railroad track literally to go see what those neighborhoods uh, were like. And my neighborhood people looked like me. And that was my reality growing up. I had diverse friendships at school, but in my neighborhood, everybody was like me. My family, everybody was like me. The church we attended, everybody uh, looked more or less like me. Um, as I grew up, uh, I, I uh, dated white girls. Um, when I went to college and after, I had white roommates. Uh, even becoming a pastor, I have served until now predominantly, I mean, major, vast majority 
white churches and ministries. That has been my experience, and I suspect for many of you that's been your life experience, that you, you maybe have gone to school in a diverse place or maybe you've worked in a diverse place, but in reality your inner circle may not be nearly uh, as diverse. Uh, when I was a campus minister at FSU, I, I thought that it was important that my uh, students go on mission trips for the purpose of, of growing through seeing the world in different eyes. Like it's, it's, there's value to getting out of your, your circle and your bubble. And so I wanted them to see what the, the, the third world, um, others who weren't as fortunate. And my hope was we could find a place where we would make a difference. Now, now notice, that was my motive. It was for my students and the place where we were going. I hadn't even considered what difference it might make in my life. I've been on lots of mission trips. They're great. Love to see the world. Love to travel. But I was thinking about the impact it would have on my students. And I was thinking about the impact it would have on the people we served. I never thought about what impact it might have on me. Um, so you've heard me talk about before. We ended up finding a place in Guatemala. It's a little village called Chantala. It's in the central highlands of Guatemala, about 4,000 feet above sea level. Small village uh, inhabited by indigenous Mayan people, uh, Native Americans. And, uh, and among the Mayans, there's 20-some groups, I think 23 different Mayan groups. They speak different languages, just like we talk about tribes of Native Americans here. Um, so they speak different languages, have different traditions. Uh, the group that I uh, have gotten to know are Quiche Mayans. It's spelled like quiche, but it's Quiche. Quiche Mayans. Uh, subsistent farmers growing corn on land that they inherited from their ancestors. They live in adobe houses for the most part, made from mud from their own soil of their homes uh, or their land. Um, dirt floors often. They make about $2 a day and live on that. They eat traditional Mayan food, tamales, uh, corn tortillas, and other things that they grow themselves. Uh, the women still dress traditionally for the most part, and they still speak together with each other the Mayan language, Quiche, though, though Spanish is familiar to many of them if they've been to school, um, not all of them. Uh, one of my very, I think it was my very first trip, we were working uh, on building some classrooms, um, and I noticed that people were going into the church. Now, now, up to this point, all of my interactions with the locals had been through an interpreter. Uh, and, and so I, hadn't, I didn't know Spanish, I didn't know Quiche, and so I was, I was not really interacting with them other than, you know, asking questions and getting information through the interpreter. Uh, but I noticed they're all going in, and I knew they spoke Quiche, but I don't know that I'd even heard it. When my next break, I went over, nosy that I am, and what are they doing, you know? And I, I looked in and listened, um, and, and I discovered the, the strangest sound I think I've ever heard. Um, in, in Mayan Christian churches, uh, everyone prays at the same time, their own prayer. And they pray in their native tongue, not Spanish. They pray in Mayan. And so as I listened, I heard this, this, this amazing sound, a chorus of voices praying to God in a language I'd never heard before. And it doesn't sound anything like English. It doesn't sound anything like Spanish. And I know this probably sounds incredibly obvious to you, but in the moment it was incredibly profound to me. I had this aha moment standing in the doorway God understands them. God, God speaks Quiche. I didn't know that. Right? I don't know why I assume God spoke English. I prayed that a lot. But, uh, and there was something about that moment that all of a sudden just expanded something in me. God is much bigger than I knew. God is, is, is who God is and how God relates to God's people is so much bigger than I've ever dreamed. Um, Josiah mentioned, Josias mentioned uh, the missionaries journal. Uh, I journal a lot, and I have a special journal I only use in Guatemala. And a lot of times I'll write in it my hopes, dreams, my prayer requests, and I go back and I see how God has answered those prayers. Very early in the first few pages of my first Guatemalan journal is the question Will these people ever become my friends? Will these people ever become my friends? Meaning, I, I wonder if I could ever cross. The, the cultural barrier. I wonder if I'm just always going to be the guy that brings the groups, or could I develop friendships here? Well, the first thing I realize is to be friends with someone, you need to speak their language. Friendship through translators is hard. 
And so I started working hard at learning Spanish. I've been to Spanish language school a few times. I've studied online, uh, Duolingo. I've worked hard at it. And I have gotten, after years, I've advanced to, I would say, about an 18-month-old proficiency. <laughs> I can tell you that I'm hungry, and I can tell you that I need to use the bathroom. It's about 18-month-old, give or take. Um, I'm a little better than that, but not much. But I'll tell you what, I use every word I got. And I use hand gestures and I throw in English. We call it, you know, Spanglish there. You know, you just, you do, you just, I just, because I want to communicate with the, my friends. I want to communicate with my friends. But then I started realizing that Spanish is good. I mean, they speak Spanish, but that's not their language either. Like, even as I'm struggling to learn it as a second language, it's their second language too. Their language is quiche. And so if I really want to be friends with them, I ought to not just settle for a foreign language, I had to learn their language. The challenge is it's hard to ask how do you say that in quiche if you don't know how to say it in Spanish. Um, but I've been working at that and trying to learn it. And it's hard because there's different vocal sounds. Uh, they would tell you I speak more quiche than I do Spanish. It is absolutely not true. It's just really weird for a gringo uh, to even try. <laughs> um, I won't go through all of it today, but it's, I'll mention a few words here in just a moment. Um, one, one of my other things I wrote in my journal was a desire to go to somebody's house. I, I had gone five years in a row and nobody had invited me to their house. And you know, like you're friends with somebody when they've invited you to their house. And so I kept thinking, well, I, just, I, I wonder when they'll ever say come over. And so I've been praying about that and I developed a strategy. I, I didn't want to just say, ask right out loud. Um, there's a craft market nearby. And so I went to the craft market. And my strategy was I'll ask for things that aren't on their tables in hopes that one of them will say, no, I don't have that here, but I have it at my house. And it worked. <laughs> and I was prepared to buy whatever it was just to get it. So I went home with Jose that later I discovered, I think he's really the devil in flesh. But uh, I went to his house. He did not have what he said he'd have, which isn't unusual. Uh, and I didn't buy anything. But I did go to his house. The funny thing is, the next day, uh, my good friend Angelica came to me and said, you should come to my house today. You should come to my house today. Members of this church have now been to Angelica's house uh, when we went last fall. Um, I, I, I would take you this afternoon if you'd like. We could just go over to Angelica's and hang out and she'll serve you Cokes and tortillas or something. Um, uh, now, now, now I'm welcome and welcome to bring people uh, with me. Another thing that I discovered along the line as I was developing these relationships is, is I discovered that while you introduce yourself to someone in Spanish, they'll give you their Spanish name, but the truth is they also have a Mayan name, most of them, and that's how they refer to each other. Isn't that interesting? A formal name. I don't know if any of you have a title. You know, if any of you are teachers, you're Mrs. So-and-so or Mr. So-and-so. I'm Pastor Vance. Title. But we don't usually call our friends by our titles, do we? Right? And so I started asking, so what's your, what's your real name? And so my friend, the pastor, Hieronimo, I discovered his real name is Shrun. Don't try to spell it. Shrun. And his dad, Sebastian, his real name is Posh. And his sister, Lucy, her real name is Los. And so now I call them by their real names. And when I meet someone new for the first time, I'll say, oh, okay, that's your Spanish name. Do you have a quiche name also? Would it be okay if I call you that? Because I think we're on, I mean, there's something powerful about our name, isn't it? Has anybody ever called you by the wrong name? I can't tell you how many times in my life people call me Lance <laughs> or Vince, you know, I, or Kelly's husband or whatever. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm Vance, Vance. Yeah, right, you know, there's something powerful about a name. Um, another word that I learned in Quiche is the word which il, which il, which is the word for friend. Um, like Spanish, it's amigo, so friend. And it's, it's common in, in Quiche that you refer to someone uh, in that way. And so if you're seeing someone for the beginning of the day, uh, instead of saying good morning, uh, so-and-so, or buenos dias amigo, uh, you would say secarec, uh, uh, which is good morning, secarec with chill, good morning friend. So I would use that frequently. Well, there's a, a restaurant where I've been going for years and a hotel connected to it. I used to stay there. And at some point, it became really important to me that, that the wait staff not consider me to be somebody to be served. Like, I didn't want that barrier. So I started working hard at asking their names and getting to know them and making sure that I said thank you for things I appreciate, asking about their families. And so I would say, 
Thank you, friend. Thank you, friend. Or when they would bring me, or I'd ask them for something, and I would say, friend, every one of them on the wait staff has corrected me. Everyone, at different times, separately. They pulled me aside and say, no, it's not wachil, it's washalal. Others have done the same. Washalal, that's brother. You're not, you're not our friend. You're our brother. We're, and so when I walk, they call me bonts because they can't say V's, bonts. <laughs> and so when I walk in the hotel, I, can, I hear them say, say, watch all the bonts, watch all the bonts. Brother, right? I prayed once, I wonder if any of these could be my friends. I didn't anticipate they could become, I didn't anticipate they could become my family. Uh, that's Mario. That's my translator. Notice the cool hat he's wearing, FSU. Uh, <laughs> don't know where he got it. Uh, one time, I, he lives in a different town where my daughter lives, and, uh, and he wanted me to go to his house. So I was like, great, I want to go to houses. That's great. So we went in, I saw his house, and he said, well, sit. I said, okay. We just sat, and he said, so this is your house now. This is your house now. I have a house here that you provide. I have a house there he provides, right? Uh, that, that's, that's about relationship. You've been welcomed in, right? You've been, you've been welcomed in. Uh, another word uh, in Kiche for food is wah, wah. Technically, the word uh, is for tortillas because uh, tortilla is the main thing they eat every day, uh, but the word is wah, W-A. Uh, so one day I'm sitting with a bunch of them and we're eating food, wah, and, uh, and they were telling me uh, that uh, bread, as we have it, uh, is called kashlin wah, uh, because when uh, the Spaniards came and introduced bread, pan, uh, they called it kashlin wah, bread is kashlin wah, which means a different kind of tortilla. Kashlin just means different. It's just a different different tortilla. Well, as we're having this conversation, they just start laughing and they said, you're a kashlin si. And I said, what's, what's si? That's human. <laughs> you're a different human. And what they meant by it was, I joke with them all the time, I'm not a gringo, I'm a guatemalteco, soy guatemalteco. I'm, I'm indigenous, I'm Mayan, right? Well, I couldn't be less Mayan to save my life. And that was the joke, like, you, you're, no, you're not one of us, right? But they didn't mean it in a mean way. They didn't mean it in an excluding way. They meant it as in, you're not one of us, but you sure seem to like to talk like us, <laughs> right? You're kashlin zi, kashlin zi. Um, so one more story. Uh, when we first started going, uh, we were always there for worship. They worship Sunday afternoons at 4 o'clock because market's in the morning. I'll explain. Uh, you know why we worship at 11? Because you used to have to milk the cow before you got to church, and that's why you came at 11. That's why worship at or 9.30 or 11 it was, it came later. Well, they worship at 4 because market's in the morning on Sunday uh, and Sundays. And I learned early on uh, that when I went, I better be prepared to preach because I was always expected to. Uh, and we learned early on that every time we went, we were expected to sing a song. So early on, we would sing, you know, a song in English, you know, that we liked, and that was all good. Uh, and then we thought, you know, I wonder if we ought to sing it in Spanish. So we started learning songs that we like uh, in Spanish, and we would offer that, and that was fine. You know, I don't know if they ever understood it because our pronunciation probably wasn't great, um, but they appreciated the effort. And then one year, one of my students uh, discovered a song by a Guatemalan worship leader named Julio Melgar called Creo en Ti. Uh, and so we learned it. Creo en Ti means I believe in you, and lo que harás en mí, uh, I believe in you and what you will do in me. So we prepared it, and we sang it, and lo and behold, they knew it. And we sang it together. We worshiped together. Notice the progress there. I mean, first we show up, and we're just there, right? You know, strangers, kashlin, si. And then we offer what we have, song in English. We like it. They don't know what we're singing, but it's, our, it's the best we have to offer. And then we worked a little harder. Let's learn our songs in Spanish. We can offer that, then maybe they can at least understand what we're offering. But then we learned their song in their language. And that led to worship. Catch that? 
right? I mean, that, that's what it means to form a multicultural, diverse relationship, is to leave your comfort, to go and say, I want to know you, I want to understand you, tell me about your life, and even sometimes to stretch, tell me how, how to say this. Tell me about your food. I'd like to learn about that. Tell, tell me about your life experience. Tell me what it's like to be an immigrant. Tell me what it's like to grow up in that neighborhood. I want to I wanna know, and it will change you. Creo en ti. I believe in you, and lo que harás, and what you can do in me. That's the value. is isn't just that we kind of have superficial relationships, but that when we embrace diversity, that God, God created this diversity, when we embrace it, it changes us. Let's pray. And so, Lord, I pray that you would challenge us, even as the diverse church we are, to deepen our relationships with each other, to deepen our desire to know and be known with each other, to welcome the diversity of this community in all of its form. Uh, Lord, increase our faith in you and what you might do in us if we would open ourselves. Bless us now, Lord, as we come to your table with people around the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.